the Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Well, we have a very special guest today, somebody who who was really involved um, and an insider in the whole system, why it got to where it is now, how it got there, what you need to do about it. I'm talking about David Stockman. He was Ronald Reagan's budget director, if memory serves me correct. Controversial one at that because he actually knew his numbers and he actually uh, actually foresaw or foretold a lot of what was going to happen. He's a former congressman from Michigan and author of a number of books, the latest being The Great Money Bubble, Protect Yourself from Hyperinflation and the Coming Devaluation. Uh, that's a, a big title, a lot to uh, choke down here. Well, David, I want, first I want to say it's an honor to have you on the show. Like I say, I've been following you for since the Reagan era. Uh, hey, why is this different now? Why is this inflation different than the inflation that uh, Paul Volcker crushed back in the 80s? Well, great uh, question. Let me start uh, with my background. I have had a 50-year career half of it on in Washington, half of it on Wall Street. Some people say that means I have no useful skill. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think the larger point is I've seen it from both ends of the Accela corridor. And the mess that we're in today is the worst ever. It's the culmination of bad policy that's been going on for decades and that uh, you know infected Wall Street as deeply as it did uh, Capitol Hill. In other words, they spent like there was no tomorrow and borrowed on Capitol Hill because the Fed made interest rates so ultra low that there was no constraint on uh, you know the behavior of politicians. Wall Street found that they could make endless money speculating recklessly because one, if the market faltered, the Fed would step in and uh, bail it out with a so-called Powell put. Uh, and secondly, it kept interest rates so close to the zero line that the cost of carry, you know, in other words, these speculators uh, speculate by borrowing money and then uh, putting it into something that's going up or has a better yield. Uh, the cost of money was so cheap that it was kind of the mother's milk of speculators. So we have a system that is totally out of kilter. Fiscally, uh, we're way off the deep end with our 31 trillion of national uh, debt. Uh, but for the larger financial system, that's why I call it the money bubble, because it's not just the price of gasoline or groceries that uh, is, is the inflation story, but we've had tremendous, tremendous inflation in financial assets. In fact, that's where the inflation originally uh, uh, took hold. Um, so uh, we now have a Fed confronted with its own handiwork. It is uh, desperately trying to bring uh, the seven, eight, nine percent inflation down but the cost of doing that will be to puncture badly this huge financial bubble in stocks and bonds and real estate and ETFs and uh, cryptos, for that matter, uh, that have uh, you know enjoyed the ride as the Fed printed so much money. You know, when I was uh, budget director in 1980, the balance sheet of the Fed was not even 150 billion dollars. It's nine trillion at its recent peak a few months ago. And the, the balance sheet is nothing uh, arcane. Uh, you know, you don't need a PhD to understand the implication. The balance sheet of the Fed is simply the cumulative record of how much credit they've printed uh, out of thin air. And it's nine trillion. It has just overwhelmed the economy and created this tremendous bubble that's now, uh, you know, in the process of being punctured. And and in your book, uh, you make mention that that the income to asset ratio, yeah. household asset ratio, has gone up astronomically, and uh, and with it, of course, the debt. Now we go back to the Austrian economists, and they make the point that when you pump money into the system, 
created out of thin air, which the Federal Reserve, that's the reason for being now, uh, right. it it goes into the economy and it affects different areas differently. So like you said, we didn't see it in so much consumer prices escalating. We saw it in in asset prices, in real estate, in uh, in the stock market, because it soaked up that excess liquidity. And now we're at this turning point. So when you were budget director, and it's a while ago, yeah. I don't want to date either one yeah. of us, but yeah. in the 80s, uh, did you foresee this day coming? Uh, no, I don't think anybody could have imagined it. But um, the key point, and it was in your initial question, is the inflation that we were uh, struggling with then uh, is not the same inflation as we have today. Uh, I call that your grandfather's inflation. It stemmed from the fact that in the 1970s, when the Fed uh, got out of control and printed money too fast, it immediately resulted in rising, uh, uh, you know, uh, prices for goods and services in the domestic economy because we didn't import that much back then. There was no China. In fact, they were starving in the rice paddies uh, at that point in time because of Mao's ridiculous great leap forward and all the rest of it. Now, fast forward 30 years and we uh, have a different world. We have basically outsourced a large share of our industrial economy. Uh, goods, uh, merchandise goods are produced overwhelmingly in China, Vietnam, Mexico, and a lot of other low wage uh, venues around the world. So when the Fed uh, first uh, you know, uh, printed so much money after the late uh, 80s, it uh, worked its way into the world economy. In other words, we basically uh, exported our inflation. And in the process, we exported our industrial economy. So we had a period of time, and this is really important to understand, where the Fed itself, because they uh, pretend they're monetary central planners and 12 people can manage uh, the course of this giant economy of ours, that's totally wrong. But they uh, falsely concluded that we're in a period of low inflation. They called it lowflation, in which inflation was running below 2%. And so therefore, they needed to step on the gas because somehow they got it in their heads that the job of the Fed is to get at least 2% inflation come hell or high water. Well, it wasn't really a sustainable low inflation. That's my key point. We were importing back into the United States uh, low-cost goods from all those jobs that we had exported. And as a result, this is a startling figure, but from 1995 to 2019, before the COVID money printing thing went crazy, the price of durable goods in the index, the CPI, dropped by 40%. That, that's just stunning. In this day and age, nothing drops by 40%. But if you look at the share of the GP uh, uh, of the CPI, this durable goods, uh, it dropped by 40%. Now, what that meant was we had underlying inflation in domestically produced services all along of 2 to 3%. But since on a one-time basis, we were importing back in the form of manufactured goods, all that cheap labor, uh, it, it blended into the uh, top line CPI or PCE deflator, which the Fed uh, prefers to use to an inflation rate that was below 2%. It wasn't, it, you, know, once, you know, once you had exported your industrial economy and you reached the peak of let's say supply chain cost reduction, then you were back to the underlying inflation level <clears throat> and we were off to the races. And this is essentially what has happened. The Fed has been wrong. It has misinterpreted the data for the last several decades. And finally, when the worm turned, so to speak, and we had the great supply chain disruption uh, as a result of uh, worldwide uh, COVID uh, suppression um, uh, efforts, uh, they were like deer in the headlight. Remember for a year, they said, uh, it's transitory. It's uh, it's not a problem. In fact, I'm looking at data that came out yesterday 
from the Fed's, uh, you know, so-called uh, uh, SEP, their their economic uh, projections, and and basically what it showed is they expected inflation by the end of this year to be just over two percent. Okay, that's where they were a year ago, and here we are at uh, six, seven, or eight percent, and they had no clue that it was coming. Uh, they were uh, totally wrong. Uh, you and I knew it, but the Fed couldn't see the nose on their face. You know, uh, it's often said the cure is worse than the disease. In this case, the cure is the disease. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, I never, you asked me what has changed. Uh, the question is, um, if you went back to 1990 or 1980, did, could you have found anybody on either side of the equation that would have said, uh, inflation is too low, and the central bank's job is to make more inflation. I mean, <laughs> since, but the reason I'm bringing this up is you can uh, go, look at, um, excuse me, you can look on, um, uh, I'm getting uh, too many calls here. Uh, you can uh, find on the internet an interview in January 2020, which isn't that long ago, in which uh, basically Lael Brainerd, who's supposedly the big thinker on the Fed, was saying the Fed needs new tools to get inflation up to target. I mean, that's how far wrong they were. That's Mar That's January 2020. They're looking for tools to manufacture more inflation. Now, that is really like, uh, you know, uh, the, the cat calling the kettle or the pot calling the kettle black. The Fed is what ma makes inflation. And this particular leading thinker on the Fed said we need more tools to make even more. It's no wonder uh, that we have the mess that we have today. Yeah, and it's quite a mess. Um, now, your warning of uh, hyperinflation, coming devaluation, uh, this isn't just a problem that's going to affect the United States, considering that basically we're trading uh, worthless pieces of paper, IOUs, digital dollars, whatever you want to call them, for goods. And so consumption is way higher than it should be otherwise because yeah. it's free. Uh yeah. It's going to have a devastating effect on the global economy, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it gets to the point there is no free lunch. We know that. That's basic economics 101. But we have been living high on the hog for the last 30 years by essentially shipping paper abroad and uh, getting cheap goods back in return. Well, that caused the standard of living to seem far higher than was actually being earned being produced uh, with uh, real economic uh, output, but it wasn't sustainable. It was uh, a bubble. That's why I call it a money bubble. Uh, and as a result, households today, you know, really over, you know, 80% of households have no savings because during that whole period, uh, people uh, figured they didn't need to uh, save because uh, one, they wouldn't earn anything on it thanks to the Fed. And secondly, the bubble would go on forever and the Fed would keep uh, the good times rolling. Well, we're now finding out we're going to head into a sustained recession. I don't know that it'll be deeper or more devastating than 208, 209, or it is an, another kind of Great Depression coming. But what I do think is that it's going to last a long time because we have so much excess in the system that now uh, can't be sustained. And the figure that proves that, in my judgment, is the overall debt on the US economy, not just the government debt, the 31 billion, trillion that everybody's aware of, but the 91 trillion of total public and private debt, according to the Fed's own figures, that lies on the economy today. That's 2.6 times national income GDP. And after all, if you've got debt, the only thing that will support it, uh, service it and pay it back over time is income. And when your national debt or total leverage ratio in the economy is 2.6 times, you're in deep trouble. Why do I say that? Because if I go back to 1970, uh, at a time when we had uh, pretty good prosperity, we had 
3% growth year in, year out in uh, real income uh, per household. Uh, if we go back to 1970, the national leverage ratio was 1.5 times that there was 1.5 times debt to national income. Now, this these all sound like big numbers, arcane uh, ratios, but the difference between a 1.5 and a 3.6 ratio in today's economy, leverage ratio, is 54 trillion. In other words, we would have about 37 trillion of public and private debt today, not 91 trillion, had we stuck to the kind of prudent leverage ratio that was compatible with the prosperity of the post-war period, in fact, uh, of 100 years before that, for that matter. So the issue is we're lugging around as a national economy more than 50 trillion of excess debt, which makes everything far more difficult in terms of growth, in terms of productivity, in terms of investment, in terms of living standard, and in terms of even the federal government uh, carrying out its duties, because now that the Fed is pushing interest rates back towards sanity, the debt service costs at the federal level is soaring. It had been artificially low, 300 billion a year. It's now heading to a trillion and going higher from there. So uh, in a sense, uh, we're, we're facing the uh, day of reckoning. <laughs> uh, the chickens are coming home to roost. Companies that borrowed money to buy back their stock are now struggling with paying their interest uh, at rising rates. Uh, Washington is now struggling with a, a deficit that is over two trillion and interest costs are rising, uh, even if you manage to put a cap on everything else, which they never will do. So in sum, uh, we have uh, you know, worked ourselves into a pretty serious uh, economic bind. Uh, and until this great money bubble is punctured and purged from the financial markets and the Main Street economy, uh, it, things aren't going to uh, you know, get any better. All right. So going back in time, is this Nixon's fault for closing the gold window? Well, in a sense, yes, because whatever you may say about the gold standard, and I'm actually a believer the gold standard put a basic constraint on the Federal Reserve. They couldn't print too much money or gold would flow out of the, uh, the U.S. Uh, system abroad. And uh, we would then suffer, uh, you know, uh, a very bad economic situation domestically. Once they took the uh, constraint of making the keeping the dollar as good as gold, uh, it was uh, basically uh, Katie bar the door. Now, it took them a few years or even decades to figure out how far they could go with the printing press. But by the time we got to Bernanke, uh, we, you know, you have to realize they said, oh, my goodness, we can run this thing as fast as we want. Oh, well, of course, you can't. They created this huge money bubble. But uh, that that difference between a Fed that was shackled uh, with the gold standard in 1970 and a Fed in March uh, 2020 that basically, you know, just uh, read, ran the printing presses red hot uh, is night and day. And it explains, I think, more about our economic uh, circumstances and outlook than anything else you could uh, mention. All right. So here's a question. You may or may not want to answer it. The price of gold. There are theories out there, some might call them conspiracy theories, that the government has been artificially suppressing the price of gold through derivatives to effectively shut off the canary in the coal mine. Because when you have inflation, in theory at least, gold prices should be going up because the purchasing power of your currency is being debased, diminished. And yet, uh, we've seen uh, we've seen the price of gold go up, but not anywhere near the price of other assets. It seems uh, it seems almost unnatural, and we could add silver to that as well. Are we imagining this, or is this really happening, David? 
Uh, I think uh, we're, I, I'm not sure why it's exactly where it is today, the price of gold. And I don't really believe that there's been any massive conspiracy to suppress the price. But I do think the Fed has unleashed so much speculative momentum uh, in the um, paper markets that um, it is only, uh, you know, it's a matter of the speculators playing games uh, with the different asset classes that won't last. In other words, sooner or later, people are going to realize they've been had and they're going to want to put at least some of their assets in a safe place in real money that's proven itself over decades and decades. So uh, I think the price of gold is going to go up. I don't make predictions. I don't know if it's next year or five years from now or whether it's 100 percent or 50 or 5 percent. But it is the ultimate money. And sooner or later, people will want protection from the inflationary fiat uh, created by the central banks. So uh, if you're in gold, stay in gold. If you're looking to uh, uh, hedge your uh, wealth, uh, your balance sheet, buy a little more. Don't go crazy, but buy a little more because I think gold has only one direction to go and that's up. Okay, now going back to your career as budget director, you were vilified because... Uh, you wanted to cut back on government spending. You would have thought you were the uh, antichrist the way they talked about you. And it really kind of from that point on led to a deterioration of our political debate, which up until that point, hey, wasn't, I wouldn't call it collegial or friendly, but it was civilized. Right. Now, here we are, you know, 30 some odd years later, everything you said was right, but, you know, they said you wanted to get rid of music programs in schools and keep the military's marching bands. That was one that I remember. And that uh, you wanted to count uh, ketchup as a vegetable in the student loan program. I mean, stuff, Dave, it's off yeah. the wall. They made you out to be some kind of monster. I mean, you were like, you knew what was going on. They had to kind of get rid of you. Oh, uh, you feel like you've been vindicated at this point in time? Well, I think so. And there were a lot of those uh, efforts to demonize. But my favorite one actually was on Saturday Night Live. They had a guy who uh, appeared every now and then as me. <laughs> but, he was, he, but he was a Pinocchio figure who had a nose that extended <laughs> like several feet every time I mentioned uh -huh. something. In other words, I wasn't telling the truth about, uh, uh, you know, the danger of big deficits and borrowing and government spending and all the rest. Well, I think I've been vindicated. But the difference was even in the 80s, early mid 80s, we had huge debates about the deficit. And the issue was, how do you reduce it? And uh, there was, you know, half of Capitol Hill wanted to raise taxes. The other half wanted to talk about cutting spending, and there were about 10 percent that would actually do it. So we ended up in a stalemate, but at least there was a debate. What changed? In 1987, Alan Greenspan became head of the Fed. He decided that uh, he would throw his sound money, uh, gold standard views by the wayside, in order to become the money printer in chief and the toast of town in Washington. And that's when everything changed because once the Fed started uh, monetizing the debt, um, it, uh, it ended the debate about more taxes or less spending and uh, put everybody in uh, a kind of uh, free money, uh, easy money, uh, free lunch, uh, environment in which uh, we've got uh, the 31 trillion of public debt today. Sure. And, we, you know, you mentioned 90 something trillion. That doesn't even include the uh, mandated, the entitlement spending. Uh, we're in that age where we're getting it now for uh, however long it might last. Medicare, all that good stuff. Hey, what's your biggest regret from your days in Washington? Uh, I, I think the biggest thing was I, I didn't recognize at the time how important sound money was. I was a, a very strong gold standard guy. We tried to get it in the platform, Republican platform, and we did to some degree in 1980. But I didn't really give enough emphasis when I wrote the book in 1986 about what happened uh, in the Reagan revolution. 
uh, of how crucial uh, Paul Volcker had been in grinding the roaring inflation of the 1970s to a halt. And that uh, first, second, and third, when it comes to good e uh, you know, economics and sustaining prosperity, uh, is sound money in uh, a disciplined uh, ha hand at the helm at the Fed. Uh, that's what we've learned now because we've had Greenspan, we've had Yellen, we've had Bernanke, we've had Powell. Uh, until a few months ago, they were all rampant money printers and uh, we've ended up uh, in this great uh, money bubble uh, that has been the uh, inevitable result. And this is really a danger to the country, to your living standards, to your your grandchildren's uh, economic prospects, right? A absolutely, because it's it's ruining the foundation of capitalist prosperity. I'm not saying that all is lost and it's doom and gloom forever, but we're in a very deep ditch here uh, in terms of bad policy. And it's going to take a sweeping change in order to you know, reorient the ship of state. The only hope that we can have is that in 1980, I was part of the campaign, uh, the Reagan campaign, and everyone said the, the pundits in Washington, all the wise men, so to speak, and women, said there's not a chance that he could win. And actually he won convincingly in 80, and by a landslide in 84, uh, because people, reacted in a big way to the roaring inflation and uh, diminished uh, prospects uh, for improved living standards that came out of Jimmy Carter regime in the 1970s. So maybe in the 2024 election, after people have been punished by all this inflation and then a big recession that's going to happen next year as well, maybe by 2024 we'll have a uh, a revolt going in this country politically. Hopefully they're marching on Washington with uh, torches and pitchforks, but uh, hopefully enough to make a big swing in the election and uh, and and get the ship of state uh, righted. That is, get the Fed under control and get the budget uh, back to balance. Uh, we can only hope. Hey, what's your fondest memory of uh, Ronald Reagan? Uh, well, uh, I have to say that he was a uh, human being like no other politician I've ever met. Most of them are giant egos. Uh, they only want you to look at them and listen to them and praise them. Reagan really, uh, you know, was willing uh, to talk to anyone, to listen to people that had a point of view. Uh, and I think uh, as a result of having a ego in check, he was able to lead the country in a way uh, and make policy decisions that has not been uh, duplicated ever since. And arch proponent of of freedom and freedom, not just, uh, you know, not just of of uh, beliefs or whatever, but of uh, thought, of action, of uh, keeping the government out of your business. When you look at where the country's at now with the state of the government, its intrusiveness, we just get word that basically uh, the major social media platforms are simply an extension of, uh, yeah. of Washington, D.C. Uh, can we possibly overcome this? Well, as I say, it's going to take a realigning election a landslide in a new direction, and that will depend on whether the Republicans can figure out what their job is, which is to get the budget under control, to get the Fed under control, to get the government out of the economy and people's lives to rekindle federalism. That is, we have 88,000 units of state, local, and county government. They have a function. We don't have need Washington trying to do everything. So if they get that message right and not get you know totally off track in some of these uh, cultural issues, um, maybe they can get a mandate to begin uh, to turn uh, policy back in a more constructive direction. I think it's uh, a hard road to hope, but it's possible. And um, maybe there's some candidates on the scene that will actually lead in that direction. So is it default, debt jubilee? Uh, you mentioned buying uh, precious metals. 
probably your best defense against it. One of the other has got to happen because the debt's not sustainable. They're going to chop zeros off the uh, debt, off the currency. What do they do? Yeah, well, you know, th- there's all kinds of, I'm sure, desperate things that are going to be uh, tried. They're now trying to invent, uh, you know, central bank digital currency. That is a terrible, terrible idea. The one thing that keeps the system at least minimally honest today is cash money. That's because it's bearer money. Your name isn't on it. Uh, the bill in your wallet, your social security number isn't on it. They don't know who you are when you get it or when you spend it. And we have to keep it that way because if we get central bank digital uh, currency, the Fed, the government's going to know uh, everything coming in and everything going out. And we'll have the ability uh, to basically control the citizenry uh, via their wallets. And that would be a dangerous, that would be the end of the road. That would be totalitarian government like uh, George Orwell never imagined it. All right. Well, we really do appreciate your coming on with us, David. Again, the book is The Great Money Bubble, Protect Yourself from Hyperinflation in the Coming Devaluation, and we might add the Coming Deep, Deep Recession. Uh, I don't know what the difference is necessarily between a recession and a depression. You know, the old joke, recessions when you're out of, out of work depressions when I'm out of work, but but it certainly is coming here. Uh, it's kind of a foregone conclusion baked in the cake. Hey, the book uh, obviously is available on Amazon and wherever fine books used to be sold. If you got a question for David, you can always shoot me an email, kl at kerryletz.com, and we'll shoot it off to him. And David, I can't thank you enough for coming on. It, it's really uh, been enlightening and Really appreciate your time. Well, happy to be on your show. And I think we had a great discussion of some very important issues uh, that uh, hopefully uh, your uh, viewers will uh, think about a lot.